If you need a Bible, raise your hand. You can sit for a second because we'll stand again. But get your hand up high if you need a Bible. We're in Psalm 145. Psalm 145. I don't have a lot of time today. Say amen. I'm just kidding. Uh, Psalm 145. Get your hand up high if you need a Bible. Psalm 145. And uh, go ahead and turn there. Great. Okay. And uh, one more over here. Here we go. And let's all stand again. Okay, up, down, up, down. Psalm 145, a praise of David. The Bible says, hey, by the way, when it says a praise of David, the title of every psalm, this is just for your info, the title of every psalm is also part of the inspired work. So even though it's not necessarily in the content of the psalm, it is just as inspired. Uh, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. What are the next two words? Every day I will bless you and I will... Praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness, and I sh- excuse me, and shall sing of your righteousness. Father, again, we thank you for the scriptures. We pray that you would speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, when I think we think of greatness, uh, a lot of times, obviously, we think of things that people have done. And, you know, I mean, depending on the things that are important to us, we may all uh, have a different explanation. Uh, We may all have a different list of what we think greatness is or or who those individuals are that, you know, we perceive as great. You know, I kind of just presented, was thinking about this from, a, um, from the perspective of culture and what's important to our culture. And so I was thinking, man, what are some of the, what are some of the things that might describe from a culture, cultural perspective greatness? Uh, so, of course, you know, we all use YouTube. And I was thinking, what are, what's the video that's had the most views ever on YouTube? Do you know what it is? Okay. Let me tell you what it is. Uh, this guy's name is Luis Fonzi. And he wrote us, I don't even know if that's how you pronounce his name. But he wrote a song called Yankee Daddy or Daddy Yankee. Five billion views. Isn't that insane? Can you imagine five billion? They're not 5,000 or 50,000 or 500,000 or 5 million 5 billion views. Um, I think about a $717 billion technology empire. I mean, that's, that's greatness from a human perspective. Uh, the individual that started that, you know, mostly was Bill Gates. Um, I think about the actor who has uh, the highest grossing films of all time. That would be Samuel L. Jackson. Um, and then when I think about greatness, of course, I think about six Super Bowl rings. It's not my fault. Don't get bad at me. Uh, and of course, that individual is. Come on, you know, you're like, you know, you know, don't be all bitter. Don't be a hater. But look, you know, we may, uh, you know, you can look at that and sincerely say, man, $5 billion views or $717 billion empire or six Super Bowl rings. And, and you know, that might be great from a human perspective. But I would say to you, what is any of that compared to God's greatness? What is any of it compared to God's greatness? You know, this is what we do as humans. We measure our greatness in comparison to each other in any particular field. And then when someone excels in that field, if they raise the bar incrementally, we would view them, you know, in some ways as the greatest in their field or maybe the greatest of all time. And maybe it's not some new person that's pushing the bar from a human perspective. Uh, maybe it's somebody who in their field has been unsurpassed for, for hundreds of years. And so there, there might not be a new goat. It might be an old goat. But I would say to you, no, no goat compares to God. No greatest of all time from a human perspective compares to God. And we may get all caught up in it. And we may compare ourselves with each other and think that we're great. But listen, who compares to the Lord? And the Bible says that God's greatness 
is unsearchable. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But it just simply means you'll never get to the end of it. Like with God, there is no bar. With God, there is no limit to his greatness. You know, the second you think that you've got your, uh, your hands handling the greatness of God, like you've got it under your belt, you really understand it. There's, there's nothing more that could be said um, that would make you think that he is greater than he discloses some new thing. Uh, either, in the, either in the book, the Holy Scriptures, or in your life. And it's like, man, God, you know, I thought you were great, but I, but I really didn't even have a clue. I had no idea just how great you actually are. David titles this psalm, A Praise of David. And listen, by the way, it's the only psalm that he titles uh, like this. And so... You know, I'm not saying today that none of, other, none of the other psalms that David wrote were psalms of praise, but it would seem that David saved this title for this particular psalm. And so in a way, like remember, David is an artist. He is the psalmist of psalmists. It's almost like David is saying, hey, yeah, you know, I wrote some other psalms that were psalms of praise, but this is the psalm of praise. This is the masterpiece, and I think that it is, in fact, his masterpiece of praise because it is centered on the greatness of God. Um, you might be thinking today, well, you know, pastor, I get it. You know, that all sounds theological and fine, but, you know, how is the greatness of God relevant to me? How, what does it mean to me? Like, how is that even meaningful for my life? And I, I would say this to you this morning, understanding God's greatness leads you to worship which leads you to personal transformation, which leads you to influencing the world, all of which leads you to fulfilling your purpose. Can I, can I just break that out for a second? Can I? Can I? Somebody say yes, please. Thanks. Thanks so much. Okay. Understanding God's greatness leads you to worship. So as the Spirit of God is enlightening your eyes of understanding, as your eyes are opened, as you are seeing through the disclosure of the Spirit of God, the greatness of God, this is what it compels you to do. It compels you to respond in worship. Like you give God glory, you give God praise, you center your life around Him because as the Spirit of God takes pleasure in revealing the Father to you, there is only one you know that is worthy of centering your life around. Understanding the greatness of God leads you more and more to be a person of worship. And as you worship God, listen, this is what he does. He transforms your life. How awesome to be in a place where as you choose to be a worshiper, as you're giving God what God deserves, he at the same time simultaneously is working in you. This is awesome. He is working in you and shaping you and changing you as you choose not to center your life around yourself. Because listen, when you center, Christian, listen, when you center your life around yourself, that will never lead to transformation. Why am I not growing, God? Why does everybody else seem like they're growing but me? Well, maybe it's because you're focused on yourself or you're focused on other people, or you're focused on your circumstances, your eyes are either inward or your eyes are outward, but your eyes are not upward. And when you choose to look upward and worship God, God transforms and changes your life. And then this is what God does. God takes that life that's being transformed and he causes it to be an influence in this world. As God is changing you, as God is doing that work of sanctification in your life, as he's making you more like his son, Jesus Christ, you then become a world changer. You become an influence for the gospel in this world. And all of that together leads to you fulfilling your purpose. I can't tell you how many times I have Christians coming to me and saying to me, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know why God has made me. I don't even know what I'm here for. And I say, you're here to worship God. Okay, your purpose is to worship him, to get caught up in his greatness, to center your life around him. And as you do that, look what God does. He changes you. He causes you to be a world changer, an influencer. And then as you do that simply, then your life is fulfilling the purpose that God has made you for. You know, I would go as far to say um, that... The majority of our struggles as Christians 
can be related to either a misunderstanding of God's greatness or an unwilling to focus on it. So today, just a couple of things real quick because I don't have a ton of time. Um, the first thing I want you to notice in this psalm is this. David gave praise in the highest way. David gave praise in the highest way. Let me reread verses one to three. Um, he says, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I, are you getting this? I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. David was a man, and you guys know this, you know this is true, David was a man who gave God praise in the highest way. But would you just notice here that, that for David, praising God was a choice that he made? Praising God was a choice that he made. Praising God was not just, a, was not just um, the byproduct of the circumstances that he was in. Okay, listen, sometimes for us, this is what praise is. Praise is a byproduct of our circumstances. And if our circumstances are good, we praise God. And if our circumstances are not good, we don't praise God. But that's not what David says. David says that praise is a choice. It's a choice that we make. It's not a byproduct of our feelings. It is not a byproduct of our circumstances. It is a decision that we make. And I love David in how creative he was in praising God. Now, look, you might say, well, David, was a, he was a poet. Of course, he was creative. But, but I still appreciate his creativity. And, you know, David was a man who had uh, a very strong grasp of the Hebrew language, certainly because he was inspired by God, but he, he knew his words. He had a very full vocabulary. But in this psalm, it's almost like, you know, it's almost like he is expending every word that he can in his vocabulary to express just how great God is. And I appreciate the creativity, and I think, you know what, sometimes we need to be a little more thoughtful, we need to be a little more creative in the ways that we give God praise. While David expends all these different words, he also at the same time knows that there's an incompleteness, that even though he's used all the words he could use, they still fall short. You know, when you're in love... You know, guys, husbands, you know when you're in love? Oh, Lord. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> We're going to go back to relationship series. You know when you're in love, guys, husbands? Yeah. All right. Awesome. You know, there are times where, where you just, you, you love your wife. Maybe you're writing a card or, or you're just talking to her and you don't, you just don't have the words. You're like, you have no idea. You don't have the words because, look, you're so in love that no words could ever really express, but you know, what, you know what you do. You still, you put your best foot forward and you give all the words that you can because you know just saying to your wife, hey, honey, wish I could tell you, but can't, so I'm leaving the card blank. That's not, like, that's not going to work. Look, you do your best. You say what you can, but when it's love, listen, when it's love, you know that no amount of words will ever be able to convey but you still do your best. You know, this is such a creative psalm. It's an acrostic psalm. Do you know what an acrostic psalm is? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, great. Well, that's great. Okay, good. Six of you know. Listen, for the rest of you, this is what David did. You know, the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters, and this is what an acrostic psalm is. David was this creative in praising God. Sentence number one, first letter, first word, Aleph. And then he writes... Uh, a sentence of praise. Second sentence, first letter, first word, bet, the second letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Third sentence, first letter, first word, al aleph, bet, dalit. Fourth, <laughs> fourth, Hebrew's not easy, by the way. Fourth sentence, first letter, first word, gimel, and he works his way. This is how creative he was. Why was he this creative? Because he believed that God was this worthy. Because he believed that God was this worthy, like God was this worthy of creativity. God was this worthy of time. Pastor, I don't have time to praise God. I don't have time to think creatively. I would say you don't have time not to. 
And so he uses words like this, I will extol my God and my king. The word extol means to reach high, it means to rise up, it means to raise, it means to lift, it means to lift high. Did you get it? Did you get it? Can I say it again? It means to reach high, it means to rise up, it means to raise, it means to lift, it means to lift high. David says this, you are my God. And I think he says God and king specifically because he's expressing two things. You're my God. You are the one that I've oriented my life around. You are the one and only one that I worship. Okay? You guys with me still? You are the one and the only one that I worship. You are my king. You are the one and the only one that I serve. So you are my God. You are my king. The one I worship, the one I serve. I lift you up. I raise you high. I want you to be exalted. I want you to be magnified. I want your name to be the highest name. When you came in today to give him praise, did you extol him with all of your heart? Did you raise him up? Did you lift him up? He goes on to say, I will bless your name. I will bless you. I will praise your name. The word bless in Hebrew is barak. It means to fill to fullness. It means to fill to fullness. It means that there's no space left. You've given all that you can. Listen, you've given all that you can and you can't give any more. You've blessed him. You've given all that you can and you can't give any more. Like in Vegas terms, in Vegas terms, you've left it all on the table, okay? When you, when you give God praise, listen, you want to bless him and you bless him when you leave it all on the table. When you came in today to give him praise, did you leave it all on the table? Did you, did you give him 100%? Is, is there, like, when we're done, we should, be, we should be in the spot where it's like, man, I have depleted myself in this moment of blessing him. There's nothing left in this moment for me to give. I've given all that I can give. Um, he says, I will praise your name. The Hebrew word for praise is hallel. This is hallelujah is a compound word. It means praise to Yahweh, the name of God. And this is what he says, I will praise your name. I will make an exclamation. I will give it admiration. I will boast in your name and in your name alone. So David uses cre creative words, right? To extol, to bless, to praise to lift, to lift high, to fill to fullness, to make an exclamation, to make um, our boast. And, and then he says in verse two, he says, I will do this, not only forever, I will do this every day. Church. <laughs> Pastor, I just pray on Sunday, or just praise on Sunday. No, the Bible says, look, if you're going to be biblical in your praise, you need to praise him every day, every day. You're like, look, if I had Pastor Tony with me every day, I'd do that. And hey, while our, our worship leaders are gifted and amazing, you don't need a worship leader to lead you in the praise of God. You don't need a worship leader. As sweet as these times are, you know, some of the sweetest times of praise you will have will be in the secret place when it's just you and him, when no one else is watching your expression of praise, when no one else is evaluating, but it's just you and God, when the revelation is coming directly through the Holy Spirit, through his word, with, with no intermediary, and you have that moment. Listen, we are called to praise him every day, and I would say this. That means that praising God is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that we choose to live. So you say, well, you know, give me a reason why I should. I say, well, this is the reason. David said, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. God is great. The Hebrew word is gadol. He is big. That's what the word means. It means big. It means immense. It means to be unmatched in significance. Listen, is this your view of God, church? Is your view of God this, you know, when you think about the greatness of God? Yeah, he's pretty good. He's okay. You know, like in comparison to other gods, he's not bad. Like that sounds absurd, doesn't it? Does it not sound absurd? But listen, this is how some of us praise him. This is how some of us praise him. Like if you were to evaluate the greatness of God based on the way we praise him, if someone's just watching, because this is what David is saying, and you've got to get this. 
Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Look, our expression of praise should correlate, should be correlated to his greatness. So the way we praise expresses just how great he is. And if, listen, if someone was watching, and I'm not saying that we praise so that other people can evaluate, but if other people were watching our life over the course of the seven-day week, would they say little praise? Would they say meager praise? Would they say minor praise? Because listen, little praise, little God. Meager praise, meager God. Excessive, full, great praise, great God. And you'll never get to the end of that. You might today, you might be thinking, well, pastor, I'd like to do that, but, but I'm just sad. I'm sad I'm low, you know, I'm, I'm in a valley. Or, Pastor, I'd like to do that, but you know what? God hasn't provided the way that God, I think God should provide. Um, Pastor, I'd love to pra- praise him like that, but you know, no one loves me. People have failed me. The church hasn't come through the way that I think the church should come through. You might be thinking today, you know what, Pastor? I just don't feel like it. I don't feel like praising God like that. And my response to to that would be, when you don't feel like it is when you need to praise him the most. When you you are low, when you are discouraged, look, when you have been let down, because what? What are you going to do? Are you going to make your praise of God be based off of circumstances? When the provision comes through, then you'll praise when people behave the way you want them to, then you'll, then you'll praise. When you feel lifted up, when you're on the top of the mountain, then you'll praise. I don't think so. Those things will never sustain you. You praise God because he is a great God and because he is deserving of praise. And you know what he does. Like, you know, that he is so good. He loves to give to us. He deserves this. This is, this is his rightful due, in a sense, But you know, when you come in and you are low, when you come in and you are beaten down, when you come in and you are hurting, when you come in and you have been betrayed, when you are dealing with circumstances that aren't working out the way that you want them to, and you choose to give God what he deserves, in those moments, he is so good to lift you up out of the pit, to lift you up out of your miserable feelings, to to lift you up out of your unfulfilled expectations, to lift you up out of the miry clay of your own making, your own sin, right? This is how good God is. He loves you that much that when you choose to praise him, he works in your life. He works in you and he blesses you because God loves to bless you. He loves to bless you. And, and listen, this is the unending process of the Christian because his greatness is unsearchable, because you're never going to get to an end to his greatness, because you're never going to say to me ever, because you're never going to say to me ever, hey, I just ran out of things to praise him for. You know, hey, pastor, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to, but you know what? I, I, I praised him for the five things he's done in my life and I've just kind of run out. So you're never going to be in that spot because God will always be doing something new in your life. We love the Pacific Ocean, and um, Rachel and I had the opportunity to travel up PCH not that long ago, and this is, real quick, this is, I, I love traveling up Pacific Coast Highway because it's almost like every time you come around the bend, every time you come around the bend, there's this beautiful new thing that you see, you know, especially if you start um, at the Marin Headlands just on the other side of San Francisco and start working your way up, it's like, man, you turn around the corner. It's like, whoa, man, look what God has done. That's amazing. So much so that, you know, when you're coming around that corner and you can't see it yet, you can't see it yet, your heart is beating and you're excited because you know that whatever it is, it's going to be awesome. Whatever it is, it's going to be awesome. Now, I'm just saying this, this should be every day with the Lord. This should be every day in our relationship with God. God finishes a day. He's faithful. He sustained us. And, and, you know, we pray and we thank him. And, God, if you bring tomorrow, right, if you bring tomorrow, help me to see the great things that you are doing so that I can be a person who chooses of my own volition to give you the praise that you deserve. Praise him in the highest way. 
Now, look, as we work our way through this psalm, there are five categories that David focuses on um, to express the greatness of God. Um, and each of these categories is a, a beautiful expression of God's greatness is what we're going to work through. And each of them brought David to a place of praise. So category number one, real quick this morning, is this. Um, he saw God's greatness in the things that God had done. Verse 4, one generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. He says, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. He says, men shall speak of the might of your awesome gifts, or excuse me, the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. So for David, God's greatness was unsurpassed, and he believed it was to be praised as his greatness was displayed in all that he had done. God's greatness is unsurpassed, and the right reaction to the greatness of God is praise as God has revealed his greatness in everything that he has done. And he does this from generation to generation. You say, well, pastor, um, I, God's just not moving in our generation. I say, wake up. Wake up, church. God is moving in our generation. And we, if, if we're paying attention, if we're looking with the eyes of faith, we see what it is that God is doing. But I think what David is saying here is that the older generation should be saying to the next generation, consider all that God has done. Consider the faithfulness of God. Consider all of his works. We want to say to you, generation that's coming up, that God never fails, that God is always at work. Listen, and just as God has worked in us, the older generation, I'm not going to tell you what that age bracket is, but just as God has worked in us, this older generation, so he is also going to do works in your generation. We need to make sure that the church doesn't push out the older people, but that also the older people understand that God's not done with them. You might be thinking today, you know, I'm old. You know, I'm going to ride off into the sunset. I'm too old for God to use. I say Moses was 80 years old when God spoke to him in the burning bush on Mount Sinai. 80? 80? You're not, you're not too old. And he was 120 when God took him to glory. So you're never too old. God has got a plan for you. And God wants you to be sharing with the next generation all of the wonderful things he has done. David is descriptive here. He calls the works of God mighty acts or wondrous works or awesome acts. Listen, in other words, when God is doing something, it brings you to a place of awe. They're mighty. They're strong. For instance, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, he delivered the nation of Israel there are so many things that God has done that provoke you to a place of speechlessness because when God moves, you know it is the Lord. Now, you might be thinking today, well, I just don't, I just don't know what those things are. I just, pastor, I'd love to have something to praise him for, but I just don't know uh, about any of his mighty works. And I say, if you don't know, then put your face in the book, put your face in the Bible, like start to read from cover to cover about all that God has faithfully done and not all that God has just faithfully done, but all that God has promised to do in the present, and not just all that God has promised to do in the present, but also all that God has promised to do in the future. Listen, we're people of faith, and so we can look back on the works of God, and we can give him praise for how faithful he has been, for the might of his work, for how he has demonstrated his power and his loving kindnesses, we're people of faith so we can look forward to unfulfilled prophecy and because God spoke it, it is as good as done and we can praise him by faith for those things that he will do. Jesus Christ has not come back yet, but he has promised to come back so we can praise him for the coming that hasn't yet happened. Are you with me? Do you understand that? The millennial kingdom is not the era, clearly, it's not the era that we're living in, but we know that kingdom is coming and we will rule with him as he rules with the rod of iron. It has not happened yet, but we can give him praise for it because we know he has said that it will happen. The greatest work of God, 
The most wonderful work of God is the cross of Christ. You know, if you have nothing else to look to, maybe you're in that spot where the valley is just so deep and your heart is just that broken and you're like, don't talk to me about the Red Sea. Don't talk to me about manna from heaven. I can't even look forward to the second coming. Let me give you something to hold on to. The cross of Christ, the greatest work of God in human history for all of eternity is the sacrifice of his son, that God so loved the world that he delivered up his own son. Christ was incarnate. Christ lived a perfect life. Christ died in your place and in my place and took the penalty that we deserve for the sins that we've committed so that this relationship with God that's been broken because of our sin could be healed so that we could experience God's forgiveness, so that we could be reconciled. And listen, if you have nothing else to hold on to except the cross of Christ, if you have nothing else to praise God for but the cross of Christ, I would say you're in a great place. He didn't, he didn't leave. He didn't leave his son on the cross. He didn't leave him buried in a tomb. The, the stone was rolled away. Christ rose again triumphantly on the third day. And he's ascended to the right hand of God the Father. Listen, I'm saying to you today that God has done works. God has done works worthy of your praise. And it's not just what's written in the book. It's also what he's writing in your life. So David uses three words here that I just want to wrap up with and consider. Number one, verse five, he says this, I will meditate. I will meditate. So church, let me just say this to you. Meditate on the great things that God has done. Meditate on the great things that God has done. Think about it and think deeply about it. Consider it, ponder it, make it a, a point of consistent thought. Take the time even to write down uh, the great works that God has done in your life personally. You know, some people say you're having a hard time falling asleep. You don't have to pop a pill, just count your blessings. Um, because as you count your blessings, you know, you'll find yourself resting in the Lord. And, um, and I would say, hey, listen, that's not a bad exercise, but, but I would get a piece of paper and a pen or your iPad or your iPhone and then just start, because you use Apple products, <laughs> and just start making a list. How many times has God parted the sea for you? How many times has God rained down provision for you? How many times has God brought you a word of wisdom when you were in need and you were searching and you were begging and God opened up the scriptures and gave you the guidance, helped you with the decision? Listen, write those things down and make a memorial out of those things because you're going to go through it again. You're going to go through the trial again and you want to be able to look back and say, God was faithful to me then. I know he will be faithful to me now. And as you choose to see with eyes of faith, listen, this is what happens. You're provoked to praise God and to worship him before the miracle comes. And I just want to say to you, that's a place of faith. It's one thing to praise God after, after he answers, after the check is written and is deposited in the bank, after the decision's made and you see it's the right thing. Hey, it's one thing to praise God in that spot after you've turned the corner. It's another thing to praise God before the answer comes, before the miracle is done, before the mighty work of God is expressed. To know because God has been faithful in your past, he'll be faithful in your present and this happens in your life when you're meditating, when your thought life is focused on God's faithfulness, not on your fears. The second thing he says here is this, verse 6, men shall speak. Men shall speak. So the second thing I would say to you today is this, declare it, talk about it, speak about it. Thank you. Awesome. Agreed. If God were to say to you, hey, I've taken all of your conversations in your life and I have them on a hard drive. Does that make you nervous? Maybe a little nervous? I've got all of your conversations on a hard drive and I've broken down your conversations on a pie chart and this slice reflects how often you talk about yourself. Okay, let me, this slice, <laughs> this slice talks, this slice expresses all the times you complain to other people. This slice expresses all the times you said things that weren't pleasing to me. 
And this slice represents all of the praise that you gave me, all the times that you publicly de declared, all the times that you made it a point to talk about my greatness and the goodness of my works. Now, I'm just going to ask you, you, okay? I got me. I got my own pie chart. I'm just going to ask you, how big is that slice? What's that slice look like for you? You know, when we think about declaring and talking about, and I'm not trying to manage the way that you speak. I'm not trying to manage the content of your conversations. But I'm saying this, it should, it should be predominant. It should be a big slice of the pie. You know, there should be a lot of stuff that we have to talk about, you know, in meaningful ways about how good God has been to us. When I got saved, you know, um, I remember people saying to me, you know what, just stop talking about this. You're always, you know, it's always Jesus. It's always about what God's doing in your life. And, you know, as a young believer, I had to really think about, I had to think about that. And I'm like, man, if, if I don't talk about him, I got nothing else to talk about. Like, I mean, it's, I'll just be sitting there, basically. We should have, we should be having these conversations with your family, husbands to wives, wives to husbands, parents to kids. You're sitting around the table. You're talking about what God has done with your friends in the workplace. There's meaningful ways you can do it. Using your social media as a platform to talk about. You know what I'm talking about? Because social media can be just so miserably used. But at the same time, it can be an awesome platform to talk about the greatness of God and using your Facebook or using your Instachat or your Snapgram or, you know, however it works, just using it. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 17, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. That's a New Living Translation. Hey, the final thing is this. That thanks for being patient today. The final thing is this. Sing about it. Sing about it. We have a singing faith. I'm thankful we have a, a singing faith. I love to worship with you guys. I love to sit in that corner over there, and I love to watch you all worship the Lord. You're like, that's a little freaky, Pastor. <laughs> Look, I can't help myself because we're, we're a church that loves to sing. We love to give God praise. You know, we love to honor him. And, you know, there's, there's an expressiveness that I appreciate um, that comes from this congregation when we are caught up in the presence of God and we're giving him what he deserves, and I'm thankful for that, you know, and I love to sing to the Lord. I'm glad we have a singing faith. You might from time to time think, man, another worship band, another worship band, another worship CD. Like, what is this all about? How many songs can you write about God? And I would say not enough. Listen, not enough. There couldn't be enough worship bands. There couldn't be enough songs written about him because you'll never be able to exhaust him as an object of worship. And God is always doing a new thing in the hearts of his sons and daughters who love him. We have a singing faith. And so listen, sing with all of your heart. Give God praise. Give him praise because he deserves it. I know, look, I'm not, I, I know we all are different individuals, right? And we all have different personalities. But don't be too dignified to worship God with all your heart. Don't be too sophisticated. You know, pastor, don't you know where I live? Don't you know what car I drive? Don't you know the business that I own? I can't just, I can't just, I can't just worship like that in an undignified way. I say to you, you know, that's exactly what David's wife said to him when he brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And she's like, man, you're parading yourself like one of the servants. Like, what are you doing worshiping like this? You're so undignified. And he said, woman. <laughs> he said, woman, you ain't seen nothing yet. I will be even more undignified than this. Because God is, God is worth that. God is worth that. I'm not going to allow myself to, to be limited because some other person is criticizing. And I'm telling you right now, there will always be a Michael in your life. You know, the, the, certainly it's always the devil because, look, when you're worshiping God in, in an unrestrained way, when you're like Mary of Bethany and you're in the house of Simon the leper and you're looking, there's Lazarus, there's this guy who was a former leper and you're like, man, he's done so much in my life and it's just days away from the crucifixion and your heart is moved like Mary who went and took the, the flask of alaba the alabaster flask of oil and she brought it. This was her dowry. This was her 401k. This represented everything that she had. And she split the lid and she blessed him. She emptied it out. She left it all on him because he was that worthy. He was that worthy. 
And you and I need to be in that place where, where even though the enemy is saying to us, because this is what he does, when you're worshiping God and giving him all that he deserves, the devil is jealous because he wants what you're giving to God. And so he will discourage you. He will send thoughts in your mind, man, what are other people thinking? What do other people think about me singing? You know, maybe your voice isn't. <laughs> Sometimes for me, like when someone's got a really crummy voice and they sing with all their heart, I love it the most. I'm like, dang, you know your voice stinks and you're still, you're still dropping it like that. That's awesome. You don't care. You don't care. You know, sometimes we're just, we're restricted. We're, we restrict ourselves. You're driving in the car. You pull up to a stop sign. Your favorite worship song is playing. You want to raise your hands. You want to sing your guts out to the Lord. And you're like, man, but what's the person next to me, you know, going to think? You know, they're going to think I'm crazy. I say, yeah. Yeah. Or they may say, hey, what song are you listening to? I love that you love God. And, and at the end, at the end, I just want to say to you, forget about everybody else. And give God what he deserves. Be as unrestrained on earth as you will be in heaven when it comes to the worship of God. <laughs> Psalm 9-1 says this, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name Oh, most high. Father, thank you, God. We, we give you the glory. Father, forgive us. Forgive us, God, that our praise has been restrained. Forgive us, God, that we have allowed both external things and internal things to hold us back. And God, we want to have a lifestyle of praise. God, we want to praise you in an unrestrained way in the secret place when no one else is watching, when no one else is seeing, when no one else is evaluating, when only your eyes are the eyes that see. I pray mostly, God, that you would do that work in our lives and that we would make the choice to praise you. Today, as our eyes are closed and as we're praying this morning, you know, maybe, maybe here you are, you find yourself at church and, you know, you've, you've never put your trust and faith in Christ personally. You know, you know some things about Christianity, but there are circumstances in your life that have brought you to this place where you're searching. You're searching for that fulfillment that I was talking about. You're searching for that purpose. You will never find purpose in religion. You will only find purpose in a personal relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. God has made you and shaped you. While evolution says you're a, you're a product of mutations over the course of billions of years, the Bible says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're shaped by God himself for a reason, and that reason is to worship him. Today, God is speaking to you, and you know that there's a, a choice, there's a decision for you to make, not to be a more religious person, but to put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for your sins, and he rose on the third day, and when you turn from sin and you turn to him, the Bible says God forgives you, God adopts you into his family. God gives you the gift of everlasting life. Do you desire that today? Today, maybe you would say, Pastor, I want Jesus in my life. I've been living without him. I don't want to live without him anymore. This morning, if this is you, right where you're sitting, I want to pray for you. It's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life to follow Jesus Christ. And so today, if you would say, I want to take that step, Pastor. I want to follow Jesus. I want to confess my sin. I want God in my life. Not another day without him. This morning, if this is you, would you raise your hand today so I can pray for you? I just want you to stretch your hand up high. God bless you over here on my left. Thank you for raising your hand. And over here on my left, far left, thank you for raising your hand. And here in the center, thank you for raising your hand. Right here in the front, 
God loves you today and he's calling you to himself and you need to choose today. You'll choose one of two roads. You'll choose to either follow him or to reject him. Today, choose to follow him. No more resisting God. This is your moment right now. I want to pray for you today. God's tugging on your heart. Just raise your hand. Let me see who you are. Today, if you're a Christian and you know that your life has not really been being lived as a life of praise and you've not really been giving God everything that God deserves and, and you know that, that the way you've lived your life does not correlate to the greatness of God, you've not been all in, you've not been really leaving it all on the table for Him 100%, but you want that today. God has been speaking to you and you know that this is the moment for you to really give Him everything. Christian, today, if this is you, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand this morning? God bless you. I see your hand in the back. I see your hands over here on my right. I see your hand in the back on my right. I see your hand in the back on my right as well. Thank you so much. Right here in the front. It's awesome. Look, you can continue on the path that you've been walking, but you know it will, it will lead to no good place. No good place in your life. God is calling you now. He loves you. Anybody else, I want you to raise your hand. Awesome, right here in the center. And over here in the back of my right. Father, thank you. God, we, we pray that you would bless and touch these lives now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, what we're going to do this morning is this. For all of you who have raised your hands, either to give your life to Christ for the first time or to align your life with him in a way that he deserves as a Christian. I'm gonna come down from behind the pulpit. I wanna lead all of you in a very special prayer today, very short. And so today I'm gonna to ask all of you who have raised your hands, I want you to stand up right now, come on forward to the front so I can lead you in this very simple prayer, okay? You're taking a step of faith. God is gonna honor it. He's doing something in your life. Now is the time to make this decision. Stand up, come forward. I'll meet you right here. is calling Oh come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh come to Anybody else today, as God is just doing a work in your life, I want to encourage you to respond to Him. You're not responding to religion. You're not saying yes to a church. You're saying yes to Jesus Christ today. And you will never regret saying yes to Him. So this morning, uh, I'm going to lead these in prayer. But if there's anybody else, just stand up right now. Tony's going to lead us in just one more moment. Um, God wants your heart. Look, you might be sitting in your seat and you know you're agonizing. You're ag There's a battle right now in your heart over this decision. And if that's you, that means that God is speaking to you. And the one who is tugging against what God is saying is the devil. And today you've got to reject the devil and you need to say yes to God. Stand up right now, come forward in faith and let God do something great in your life. Mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is called and bring your sorrows and trade.
think of joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is called oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with Blood of Jesus Christ. All right, let's bow our heads together. I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. And uh, God has promised to answer this prayer. Pray this out loud with me. God, today, I give you my life. God, I confess that I've sinned against you. I'm turning from my sin. I'm turning to your son. I believe Jesus died for me and that he rose again. And today I give him my life. It's in his mighty name that I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Awesome.